Is it just me or can dental ceramics get really confusing sometimes? It seems like every other year, new types of ceramics are coming out, new protocols are being recommended, and it's difficult to sometimes keep up. So that's why I brought on the Ed McLaren, none other than Ed McLaren, who is like this most amazing restorative dentist ever. You may also know him from making these epic like movie trailers, dental movie trailers, a prolific speaker, a master ceramist himself, as well as being a dentist. He has so much knowledge about ceramics. What he doesn't know is probably not even worth knowing. Hello, Patrice Rati, I'm Jazz Lati, and welcome back to your favorite dental podcast for your hit of knowledge and clinical tips. The kind of things I asked Dr. Ed McLaren are like, what are the latest updates when it comes to ceramics? Ceramics. What are the different types of zirconia? Let's take a step back for a moment. You know, these zirconias have been there for a while, but there's different generations. When do we know when to use each generation? Zirconia bonding has come so far. Can we now start doing zirconia veneers? I know some clinicians are. Is that okay? Is that kosher? We ask Dr. Ed McLaren. And finally, what is the difference between Emacs and Lissy, and which is better? Petrus Rati, we're in for a treat. Now, before we join the main episode, let's have today's protrusive dental pearl. I I posted this on social media recently about how to mask a metal post. So let's say you're treating a tooth like an upper central or a lower central incisor in my case with a existing post core and crown, okay? So you resection the old crown and whoa, you have this ugly metal post. And with teeth like lower incisors, for example, well, crowns are, are always compromised, right? Because they're such tiny teeth. That's why I think vertical crowns are absolutely amazing for this, right? So in this situation, which I, I shared with you and I'll describe it for my audio listeners, you have a metal post. For me, a post core is just a space filler. It's a way to actually um, have some sort of foundation restoration. So I sacrifice a little bit of the metal core, i.e. I use a tungsten carbide burr, I drill into the core labially to create a bit of space, and I use paracore white opaque shade to completely mask that metal. So now when my technician's working on it, he'll have a much easier time to mask the metal. The other way that I've seen some colleagues do it is by using like white opaque uh, tint that you can get. I know Ibaclar do one, I think it's called direct opaque. So it's just like a paint on resin, very thin low film thickness, and it's like super opaque, super white. And you can just paint that over if you don't want to remove so much. But in this case, I sacrifice some metal and I use use a, a bright white opaque core material like paracore, which I'm a big fan of, but you could also use the resin, like I said. So now we have masked that metal post and you get a better chance of getting a good shade match. Now, if you're thinking, are you concerned? Are you worried about drilling into a metal post? Just think about it. The last time you had to remove a metal post that was bonded in, was it difficult or was it easy? It was super difficult, right? Like you're there for a long time with your old Sonics and your burrs and whatnot. I did not worry at all about the, the post somehow coming loose. It was very secure. So you have to make that sort of a judgment call and case by case, but usually these posts are in pretty well. This episode is very kindly sponsored by Enlightened Smiles. Now I know it's an episode about ceramics, but a lot of times for our younger patients, composite is sometimes the most appropriate material. And if you think you can't make composite look as good as ceramic, you should check out the work by Dipesh Palma. This guy is a master dentist. He teaches his techniques using re composite and other brands to give you some amazing results working with composite resin. His course is called Mini Smile Makeover. It's fantastic. I've been on it twice now. Uh, the beautiful thing is that you can go again and again and again, and it doesn't cost you. So you pay once, and if you need to go again as a refresher, you can go for free, which is just amazing which other course offers that. You can check out the course on minismilemakeover.com. Once again, that's minismilemakeover.com. Ed McLaren, welcome to the Petrusa Journal podcast. How are you, my friend? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you? I'm, I'm, no one's ever asked me. Wow, no, no guests have ever asked me how I am. Thank you so much. I'm doing great. I'm all the better to, to have one of my people I respect so much in the dental education space. But the other thing I really love about you, Ed, is not only the, the clarity in which you, you know, educate, you are the finest dental educators out there, in my opinion, but your movies that you make are just so brilliant that, that I want the world to see them. So tell us a little bit about you for those listeners, very few listeners who haven't heard of you, and then eventually tell us about how you got into making these dental dental, essentially, spoof movies, which is just phenomenal. Thank you. Yeah, in fact, I just finished one in Egypt that we're in post right now. Post-production means that it's being edited at this point, uh, called Ceramus Never Die. It's a, it's a twist on Bond, a James I Bond movie. So, my name is Ed Bonded, okay, in the movie. But uh, <laughs> So anyway, let's say I did a dentist for like 38 years. I was a general dentist for five years and then got a little bored with general dentistry and decided I wanted to be a prosthodontist. 
Yeah, actually, kind of the real reason I went in that direction, I originally wanted to be a periodontist, but in those days, uh, the 80s, late 80s, there was such a fear of getting AIDS from a patient, right? Uh, in those days, wow. we weren't sure where it was. So I actually thought I'd just go as far away from blood as possible and work on uh, essentially older people that needed dentures. So that's how that all started. And actually, that wasn't all that much fun for me, to tell you the truth. So I searched around and thought, well, what is it I like about what I do? And I really enjoyed the aesthetic aspect. Uh, I enjoyed doing, uh, veneers were just starting to hit then. I enjoyed doing veneers. I enjoyed doing more aesthetic work. I still enjoyed doing dentures, but it was, I sort of gravitated toward people that liked aesthetics too, that wasn't just function only. So that's how that all started. And then it, it, I realized when I, and I went to pro school, like I said, and my director made us do all the lab work. Everybody thought it was a punishment except me. I mean, I was loving doing it till three, four, five in the morning, which I still do now, making all the ceramics. So that's basically how it all started. And then it just gravitated more toward, uh, you know, current concepts, minimalistic dentistry, when you start to understand what things work and why and what things don't work and why. So the movie thing started was, you know, as, as computers evolved and we all started moving to computers around 2000, I just, I just started learning programs how to edit video. And it just started with very simple stuff around 2000 uh, to just take my images of my work or my travel images and animate them in some way, which you see mostly what people do today, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, true. And so I did that for about nine years till 2008, 2009, and I started to get bored doing that. I mean, that was boring for me, and I thought, well, what's the next level? Create a movie with people in it, right? Keep, keep something. So I thought, okay, if I'm going to do that, the few other people that I saw doing it, I thought, God, if they don't relate it to dentistry, they don't keep it short, they don't keep it inter interesting, it's going to be a big flop. So I thought, okay, I got to do something that's current, uh, something that's related to everybody knows, like Star Wars, and come up with some dental theme. So that's all. That's how it started. So I came up with uh, uh, the first one was called Ceramic Wars. What was it called? The Return of the Je uh, Return of the Ceramist. Uh, and then I did a couple more of that, and then the last one I did on Ceramic Wars was called The Last Crusade. And I actually, since now Star Wars seems to be cycling in various formats, Mandalorian or Ed Wan or not Ed Wan. Uh, anyway, you've seen, seen there's so many, so many variations of that. So I just wrote. I mean, for those who haven't haven't seen it, they must appreciate that this is not just some like little like you know guy on an iPhone. This is really professionally produced, and these are just the, the finest quality, uh, you know, enjoyment in terms of entertainment that you find in dentistry. I find. Thank you. And that's why I don't have a Ferrari or a McLaren or, you know, because all the, it costs a lot. I mean, it's a lot of my time. Each movie is about a thousand hours of my time, but it's also, you know, I'm spending 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars. Normally I would have had to spend three, four, five hundred if I didn't do the work. So it just evolved into doing that. And then I just, ideas start to happen. And just like you get creative with something, I'm, I get very creative and I look for scripts or movies that I think that I can do something that's kind of cool and short. And so I've done like four now Star Wars movies. There's a fifth one I'm writing, a return of Ed a Raiders of the Lost Art, a spoof on the Matrix, a serious spoof called The Source, uh, a down and out in Beverly Hills movie where I'm a bum on the street and, and something like that. And then, um, uh, the James Bond movie, and then just a couple of other fun things. Uh, and I'm working on a movie called Cambo for Cyber, but I'm not in good enough shape, and I don't know if I'm ever going to make it. Uh, a Rambo character, and then, you know, three or four like that. So that's how it all started. Where, where is the home for all these movies? Uh, is it on YouTube or...? Well, okay, so that's an interesting, interesting question because... Uh, I have, yeah, you can go to edmclaren.com and you'll, you can see five or six of them. I've made eight, nine now, okay? That ninth one's in post. And kind of what I decided to do was not put them, uh, the, the current ones, uh, on YouTube because actually it's a draw for my lectures. <laughs> it, it's an interesting vibe. So it's, you know, 20, 30% of the people are in the room not to watch the lecture. They're just there to watch the movie, which is okay <laughs> for me. At least it gets them in the room. <laughs> So the movie I made just before COVID called Raiders of the Lost Art, I haven't even had a chance to play it except at one or two venues. And then I've got a movie called The Source I haven't played anywhere, which is a spoof on The Matrix. So I'm just waiting as the lecture circuit opens back up so I can get it out there a little bit and get people to the lectures 
and uh you know so go from there so yes yeah, so it, it was it, it was great at tubules well i'll put the link to edmacaron.com so people can check out the quality and the caliber of those movies uh, and that's something i aspire to like at the moment i make a few spoof videos i made the fresh prince of appliances uh, and that was like a two minute thing but um what you know what you do that's like my goal uh for the future so something to aim at uh, ed i love everything you was that sorry <laughs> it's a full-time job almost uh, it, it sounds like it will the hours and, and, and the, the cost and stuff but oh my god the quality you produce is, is just epic so please continue we need that kind of stuff now you are well known for many things but yeah I mean the whole play on ceramics in the movies and stuff so you are my go to guy with anything ceramics what you don't know about ceramics in my opinion is probably what, not worth knowing about so I'm going to hit you with the first question that I have which is is there still a place for feldspathic ceramic, both in terms of uh, patient demand, uh, dentist skill set, I guess? Uh, are we still being taught it at, at, at dental schools? And then thereafter, are there technicians still about who are still happy to, 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 to make these beautiful feldspathic restorations? And if you don't mind, Ed, for the younger listeners that we have, just also explain what is feldspathic ceramic and, and, and how it, it evolved within the last 20, 30 years. Well, the, the, I get into the literal definition of feldspathic or the scientific, and that would kind of screw people up a little bit. But just think of feldspathic ceramic as porcelain, the stuff that we layer on the surface, whether it be we layered it on metal, whether we layered it on Emacs, whether we layered it on zirconia or any other version of core, that uh, we also make porcelain veneers out of it. And so the porcelain veneer basically is bonded to the tooth. Instead of being bonded to the metal, it's bonded to the tooth, okay? And so, so there were several questions in that one question. The first interesting question was the demand from patients. Um, the interesting thing, the demand kind of went down for a while from patients. And because of social media being such an interesting phenomenon, uh, it's actually come back significantly because of people that have gotten famous doing it. Like the Michael Appas, you might know Mike Appa, the yep. Mike Appa. He's becoming very famous, especially in the uh, maybe more patient world than the dentist world, but also in the dentist world too. Uh, Bill Dorfman, who started Discus Dental, uh, he's basically was in my class, we're the same age, both a few minutes over 60. Um, and Bill's known for that too. Bill is probably, was, you know, probably one of the top guys known for that uh, for a number of years. And, and now the interesting thing is because they're all posting daily on this. And then you got a few other people starting to do this. There's a dentist in uh, Dubai called du Duval Alouche, who I had the opportunity to meet. Uh, and I got, and I got to tell you out there, he's probably one of the most best dentist I've seen for for a combination wow. of uh, if he's watching and not to not have your head grow but for a combination of treatment planning because sometimes we see maybe good veneers but we're questioning the treatment plan right mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, somebody's mm -hmm. thought process of why they did something in the first place because first we're doctors right so from treatment planning from uh, from ceramics he's got four or five ceramics in his office so he's been posting a lot and so what's happened uh, the last four or five years from very little requests from patients uh, that I've seen, not necessarily for me, but at the school when I was at UCLA and stuff like that, all of a sudden people are coming in now because they're so savvy on the internet. They know where to go. They're seeing this. Hey, what's this porcelain veneer? And more than that, they even know what it is now. And they go, that, that's really what I want for my tooth. So I think the market is there. I really believe the market is there. Then the second question about the aesthetics, you know, most of us have all done Emacs or Empress or GC Lisi monolithic, and it's good. You know, it looks good, but it doesn't look great, okay? So the, the place for feldspathic veneers is where you got a patient that really wants you know, a very natural looking tooth, just like you'd layer composite. You wouldn't use one shade of a monolithic uh, material. So um, now the challenge then becomes where does it work clinically? Uh, so to, without getting too deep into material science, it works when we have mostly enamel on the tooth and it's not the bond. We all think, okay, we get a better bond to enamel than dentin. That's actually not true. If we have fresh, clean dentin that's not contaminated, your bond strength to dentin is actually higher than enamel, but it still fails more on dentin. And the reason why is eight time, dentin is eight times more flexible than enamel. So when you load enamel ceramics, okay, enamel, uh, so when it's on enamel, the stress passes through the porcelain and is absorbed by the enamel underneath, just like on a PFM. 
Why a PFM works is because the high strength stiffness of the metal. So that's really the key for long-term success. Does it work on, on uh, bonded to dentin? Sure. But you're going to see maybe five, six, seven, eight percent failure rate per year if you're bonding to dentin with ceramics, just because the dentin bends, the dentin bends, the dentin bends, the stress is absorbed in the ceramic. Where you're going to see probably less than a half a percent per year when you're bonding to mostly enamel. So that's really the key for me. Now I also did a study that we published because because people said, well, what if I have a little bit dentin exposed? What if it's just five percent dentin or ten percent, fifteen percent? Uh, we heard, we heard, and this was purely uh, speculation, that you could have 50% of the enamel gone from the tooth or 50% dentin exposed, and you bond porcelain, and it's going to behave like 100% porcelain. We tested that. We published it in the JPD, and, you know, nobody reads It's going to behave 100% enamel or 100% dentin, sorry? So we looked at 100% dentin, 100% enamel bonding to, 50% dentin, 50% enamel, and 100% dentin. And then we fatigued it and fractured them. So here was the results. 50% dentin exposed and 50% enamel basically behaved like 100% dentin. So that was fascinating to us. In fact, a a three-tenths of a millimeter veneer bonded to 100% enamel was stronger than a 1.2 millimeter thick veneer bonded to half dentin, half enamel. So enamel really is keen because it absorbs stress. Just pe- it's a stress absorption phenomenon. Okay, so where does that leave us? If you can't do it with fifty percent, so we also tested if we were missing ten percent enamel, twenty percent enamel, or ten percent dent exposed, twenty percent, thirty percent. So it's about thirty percent where there's about thirty percent enamel missing and ena- and dentin exposed. You're bonding to is where where that dynamic changes, where the stress starts absorbing more in the porcelain. But I'll give you another good article, the best article I found clinically, that's obviously a laboratory article. Gleeb Gorel, many of you know in Turkey, published an article just the last couple of years, he's published several things over the years, where he followed literally about a thousand veneers and bonded to enamel, bonded to dentin, margins in enamel, and here's what he found with clinical data, good clinical data, well-documented clinical data, that as long as you have at least a periphery in enamel, but dentin exposed, it does pretty well. Your failure rate may be a percent, percent and a half per year, okay? But when you have full dentin at your margin, that's when you go to an Emax, that's when you go to maybe an Empress. Empress still works, okay? But non-layer, don't layer your Empress. If you feel like you have to layer, for whatever reason, that's now an Emax or a Zirconia. So Amazing. I, I love those uh, guidelines that you gave uh, in terms of 30% and, um, dentine and 70% enamel and all those studies that you referenced. I'll make sure I, I get them in the show notes, but that's a very uh, helpful answer. But with the, with the labs now massively uptaking and going into CAD CAM and in a way I, I do find they're encouraging them to say, oh, you know what, let me just mill this for you kind of thing. So is the, do you think there is going to be a shortage of skill set from dental technicians in the future who can hand layer beautiful porcelain? Yeah. Let me, that's, that's the last question of this, but let me distill down one, maybe into one or two sentences, my clinical thought process. Okay. Mm. Obviously, if I have 100% enamel to bond to an anterior teeth, I'm doing feldspathic. When I get close to 50% dentin to bond to, then I go to a glass ceramic. I make a decision, is it an Empress or Emax? I still like Empress. Uh, it looks a little better. It's a, it's a feldspathic material that you machine. Then when I can't bond, so the time to go to zirconia is when I can't bond and, and you know basically it's gonna be sort of a conventional crown. So that's the clinical thought process. So your last question uh, about the laboratory, that's been the biggest problem. And as you know, I ran a laboratory school at UCLA. Unfortunately, we had a bad fire that closed it. I have to tell you, I get called literally daily now and several emails a week for, hey, I need to find a ceramist that can do veneers. I need to find a ceramist that can micro-layer zirconia. So we as a dental profession, organized dentistry, we're really dropping the ball on teaching people how to do that. So yes, that is a challenge. That's a challenge to find a, a somebody that can do a feldspathic a veneer well. I can tell you one of the, the laboratories tell me that one of their biggest concerns about doing this is the time involved. It's a, you know, three, four, five times more than machining something and finishing it because the model work is so different. And so actually my partner in crime in digital is Jed Archibald, 
who works with Gordon and Rella Christensen. Uh, actually, we're working on, we're trying to come up with a full digital workflow to get the model work done. So the model work and then a machinable refractory die, and we're really close. So that it's even easy for the technician, all they gotta do is layer a little bit like they were layering a zirconia crown. So hopefully that's done in the, in the next few months. But yes, we gotta train technicians. You gotta find a decent technician can do this. And it's cut, coming oh. harder and harder, yeah. On the other side of things, when you look at the dentist, especially the, the younger dentists, uh, I'm pretty sure this is also happening in, in the States as well, but definitely in the UK, uh, composite veneers have been uh, you know, really taking off. Where do you think that this is going to end up in the future? Or, you know, 10 years down the line, are we expecting some sort of a great boom in, in these composite veneer failures and then uh, perhaps a, a rising of them being converted to, to ceramic? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm all for that, okay? Uh, I, I think it's great because you, uh, you can be a little bit more conservative with your composite prep. Now, I can do almost a no prep. I'm back to the phase where I'm just prepping just a little bit because I find if I do no prep, I can make the veneers, but the margins aren't what I'd like to have, you know? So it's very difficult to make perfect margins that blend in the two. So I'm, even if I think I don't need a prep, I'm still putting the lightest chamfer on. So yeah, that's the biggest mistake that most dentists make that are doing veneers. They grossly over prep for a veneer. So yeah, I think developing the composite skills is, is a great thing and composites done well, you know, they can last seven, 10, 15 years if you buff them up a little bit. But I gotta tell you, it's, I, I, I see so many veneer cases come in or, or composite uh, bonding cases come in. And I would say if I see 20 cases, I might like one or 30 mm -hmm. cases might like one. Usually when I see a veneer case from a decent ceramics, I like more than half, let's say. I'm kind of hard on myself and hard on other people. Okay? <laughs> and so you, you, know, you, gotta, you gotta get the skill set. It's, it's a skill set. Now, one thing, the truth in advertising, because I used to do a lot of bonding, I was pretty good at it actually, okay? And I know how to layer composites. I don't do it much anymore, unless I teach a course just for fun. I, I, you know, I know all of these guys, professional friends, the Newton Falls, the Didi Dichies and all this. And when you get them off the record, you say, come on, that stuff that you're showing with all the little effects and the mammalons and the perfect surface texture, it looks like God made it, you know, and stuff like that. How long did you really, how long did it really? <laughs> And they said an average of two to two and a half hours of tooth. And I said, in one appointment, you're 10 teeth, you're spending 20 hours? No, we never got it done in one appointment. Two, maybe three appointments. So we're building it up, shaping it, sending the patient home. They come back, a little tweak here, a little addition there, a little subtraction there. And then the third visit is to polish and surface texture. So that type of composite that you see in the articles is not a simple thing, okay? It's a wonderful thing done well, but it's not a simple thing. A little industry secret shared there by Ed. Thank you very much. Very good to know. Uh, next question then uh, is, some docs are anecdotally using zirconia for veneers. Okay, now this seems a little bit absurd to me. Uh, and then on that vein, we can probably venture out and digress into, okay, zirconia for partial coverage, posterior teeth. But let's just stick on this veneers topic. Are we yet at a stage using the Marcus Blatt's APC protocol, for example, that we can predictably bond zirconia? And is this something that you condone? Yeah, okay, so let's look, maybe step back outer space for just a second, because I was just talking, doing this to Egypt yesterday, exactly what we're doing here. And because I'm going to go there to teach a course someday, they said, hey, listen, we want to learn how to match zirconia next to Emacs, so we can do an Emacs veneer and zirconia or something like that. And I said, why don't you just do Z Emacs? And so one of the first tricks that I tell people, when you're matching restorations next central, lateral, whatever, you use the same veneering material on both materials. So if I got to do a zirconia crown on one, two, okay, okay, one, one, excuse me, and I got to do a veneer on two, one, I'm going to use the same porcelain for the veneer on two, one that I did on one, one. And that solves the problem right there. It's a very simple technique, but more specific to your question, okay? So I've been sandblasting zirconia for years. I've been using MDP primer for years, both back on Illumina, when we were kind of a little concerned about sandblasting some things, could potentially weaken it, okay? But when I bonded, it didn't fracture. When I used conventional cements, I had more fracture because there, maybe you start some cracks. But, but it's an interesting thing. There was a very good paper, and you might want to look it up. I believe it was in Dental Materials by Matthias Kern. Um, he did a, looked up all the cohort studies and did a, a meta-analysis of several different studies. And in, in 2015, it hasn't changed that much. We sandblast, use a little. That was for resin bonded bridges, though, right? That was for resin bonded bridges, right? I think yeah, that paper. Right, but, but still for resin bonded mm. bridges, okay. Um, even it, but it, it, if we had a phenomenal bond, it shouldn't come off. 
Several yeah. of the studies had very low clinical success. All right, so yes, I could demonstrate, and I did I did some work with John Burgess and Nate Lawson. I was part of their team, or they were part of my team. We're all part of a team for a couple of years. Had an opportunity to look at that. You can get phenomenal bond strengths on day one when you sandblast zirconium, put an MDP primer on it. It looks good, but when you shear it off, okay, even though the bond strength is very high, it's it's an adhesive failure. It's always an adhesive failure. It's not ripping out the ceramic on on one side, and. Burgess also did a study where he looked at sandblasting and no sandblasting. So super smooth zirconia, then what he sandblasted, which is going to give you a little bit of roughness. Nothing like sandblasting the glass. It'll give you a little bit of roughness, all right? Then he used an MDP primer on both. And basically what he found was about 70% of the bond strength, so more than half, let's say for sure more than half, was because of the chemistry of the MDP primer. The chem the chemist, the, the, and, uh, all of these primers can dehydrolyze in the mouth. They can break down in the mouth. So if we see some leakage, which sometimes happens, okay, that, uh, that uh, that's the reason for failure. And by the way, about roughly about 10 to 12 years uh, after sandblasting my Procera crowns and using that original MDP primer, which is still the main one everybody uses, I had a few crowns start falling off just because the cement hydrolyzed, it broke down. So I'm giving you a little scientific perspective. I worry about the long-term clinical bond strength of zirconia until we can effectively etch it and effectively get a really good micromechanical bond. So I gotta agree with you. I don't see the rationale of doing zirconia veneers when we already have somebody else, something else that works that doesn't break. So Emacs, lithium disilicate, uh, GC Lisi, Vita has Suprinity, they have Ambria. There is one out of Korea that looks really nice. There's six, seven, eight, nine products on the market that monolithic look better than zirconia that don't break that we can etch. So that's what I would recommend today. Now, having said that, there's a company in Korea that makes a product, you may want to make a note of this and look this up for your viewers, called Zircos Etch, Zircos Etch for etching zirconia. It's a very caustic acid. Uh, in fact, you have to have a special vent in your lab to, to etch the zirconia, and it will etch a 5Y material. It will etch the uh, cubic form of zirconia, okay? It won't etch the 3Y, the pure tetragonal, but for, we're only gonna use 5Y, right? We're gonna use the more translucent cubic material, so you may wanna look into that, and it's a very caustic acid. You could not put your hand in it without severely burning yourself. So it's called Zircos Etch, Zircos E Etch. And, and I happen to know it works because my colleagues tested at UCLA. So if I was going to do a veneer, for whatever reason, and here's the one reason I might do a zirconia veneer. I'm going to do zirconia monolithic everywhere else, and I got one or two teeth that I just feel, oh, I just I don't want to prep it. I mean, the interproximal is good, the lingual is good, but I want to have the same material. Then I would do it. Amazing. That is really, really useful. And I never heard of the Zircor Setch. I'll look it up. That's very fascinating. Uh, so the future potentially is looking good, but I like how you answered that. Okay, maybe uh, at the moment where we are, the long-term sort of follow-up isn't, isn't there yet. And so uh, you're a little bit hesitant to, to make that recommendation. Let me just add what. So if, if you feel compelled to do that for whatever reason, maybe your lab does it, I would think a little bit more with adding a little retention and resistance form back to GV Black. Meaning if you maybe a little bit of a retention groove, mesial distal, something like that, just to add, give it a little more, more resistance form. So that if, if you're going to do it, okay? Well, that lends itself next to the second part of the question was I have some colleagues who are doing posterior zirconia onlays. Now, again, once again, I'm very much like, okay, if it's an onlay, I need to have enamel. If I have enamel, I'm going to be using lithium disilicate. So where do you have similar thoughts about zirconia monolithic uh, onlays that are bonded posteriorly? Well, I mean, it's the same thought process. Uh, yeah. We were one of the, the beta test sites at UCLA for, uh, uh, for Emacs, and we started using it in 2004-ish, I think. And uh, so we, our graduate students, because it was a aesthetic program, we had multiple chairs going and two, three-year graduate students. So we did a ton of posterior Emacs. And we did roughly 3,000. And I had a deal with the patient because you had, UCLA is very protective of, of their IRB, Institutional Review Board. And I wanted data and I didn't want to go through all of that. So I just figured I'd present all the data, okay? So after uh, over 10 years of doing 3,000 
restorations on lace with graduate students, not me, graduate students. So we had a whole bunch of graduate students of my pool. I probably did two, 300, and they did the other 2,700 or so. We had one known fracture in 10 years, one known fracture of bonded, 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 bonded Emacs. And the average thickness we measured them were right around a millimeter. So okay. this millimeter, I don't believe we need a millimeter and a half. I think a millimeter is fine, maybe even eight tenths, uh, because uh, that stuff is so strong. Of course, this was non-layered, and it was all well bonded, and it was all, I, I believed, early on in sealing Denton. I learned from Pascal Manier and John Sorensen, by the way, to give him a little credit. My mentor believed in sealing Denton back in the 80s, but he never published anything about it. And obviously, everybody knows Pascal, who's, who's done the most work on it over the years. So we were sealing Denton back in the 80s when I was in, was, when I was in my PROS program. And uh, for lots of reasons, sensitivity, we, we had a good idea that it, it increased some bond strength. But Pascal's shown that roughly, roughly doubles, maybe even quintuples bond strength if you seal Denton at the preparation appointment. So when you factor all those things in, we had one restoration fail that we know of. Somebody could have moved to China and fell out of the fell out of the study, but we offered them free redual if it came back, if it failed in less than, than, than five years, which we never had one. So, so I can tell you, since that works so well and it looks so good in the mouth, uh, why, why do something that you're not sure about? That, that's uh, so true, and I, and I agree totally with that. Uh, just interesting uh, question for you. I also asked this to Chris Orr many, many episodes ago. I just want to understand your philosophy. That Let's say you're going to go to eight-tenths of a millimeter or a millimeter monolithic Emacs, for example. Is your decision-making tree anyway influenced by the biomechanical risk or the biomechanical status of the patient, i.e. large masters, known bruxist? Uh, would you then perhaps sink your burr in a little bit deeper? Does that does a, a, an, a, an active, aggressive bruxist influence your material thickness or, or, or not? So the first thing I'm looking at is, is kind of the amount of remaining enamel. So let, let's say you got that eight tenths, whatever you, whether you're building up the teeth, right? You're going to open the vertical, restore vertical, whatever you want to say that is, okay? And you got that eight tenths. If there's some enamel there, I'm not worried about it, okay? There was a study done by Gordon Christensen and a couple of others followed up over the years that they met, went into laboratories, measured the average thickness of porcelain on a PFM. The average thickness was a half a millimeter thick. And we didn't see a fracture that much. Maybe a marginal ridge somewhere, but the occlusal didn't pop off. Why? Because the metal absorbed the stress. The stress passed through the system uh, into, into the metal. So the first thought process is, is enamel. So if I've got enamel, great. I'm not worried about it being eight tenths. If I'm completely indented, I'll probably go for that millimeter. If I think it's a little thin, I might just take an extra millimeter or two off of the tenth of a millimeter or two off the dentin off the dentin, okay? Now, having said that, that's an interesting concept that comes up about biomimetics. I love that concept. I just In medicine, whether in dentistry, yes, we want to mimic structures as much as we possibly can, okay? Uh, and that's whether it's aesthetically or functionally or biologically. But we truly need to be able to do that too, right? So we have not been able to reproduce the, the dento enamel junction was as it forms, it sends fibers into the enamel and it says, sends fibers into the dentin. So when you look at a tooth, you see all those little fracture lines, those pieces of enamel are being held on by things that we haven't created yet. Okay, we haven't been able to create that. And uh, uh, enamel is a very different material than ceramics. It fails in a very different way than our ceramics. When enamel fails, it starts in the occlusal surface or facial, it goes right to the dentin and stops. When our ceramics fracture, they it fails like a spider web called a Hertzian cone fracture. So we do have to think about thicknesses. We do have to think about thicknesses. And one of the things that's bothered me that I've seen uh, that's come out when people are carrying anything too far, whether it's aesthetics or whether it's biomimetics, I see, you know, you're looking at a tooth. So imagine you're looking at a tooth, you remove all of this tooth structure, okay? So you got three millimeters of dentin maybe missing and a millimeter and a half of enamel, typical thickness of enamel. And the thought process is, okay, composite has about the same thickness or same physical properties as dentin. So let's build up a dentin core, the shape of the dentin, shape of the missing dentin. And then we're going to bond some ceramic on that uh, because that's perfect biomimetics. The composite, the same as dentin, the ceramic, basically the same as enamel. I can tell you that will be a disaster clinically. 
Okay, that's actually been done over time. Danny Mater Don and uh, Domini of uh, Da Vinci Dental came up with, oh, what he called the Encore Crown or something like that, where he made crowns. So missing dentin, missing enamel, he made copings out of composite, then put ceramic on top. Goes in the mouth, sounded like a good idea, bonded. The composite bends, 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 like the dentin would bend, bend, and the ceramic peeled away. All right, so I understand the thought process. You want to minimize or mitigate the stress to the tooth by putting composite on there, okay? That's kind of the goal, okay? The next question is, great, but do you need the four millimeters of composite? So I talked to some engineers that understand, no, no, no. But if you're missing some, well, to even the stress out, about a half millimeter of composite is all you need. You don't need four millimeters to even the stress out on the surface underneath. Ah, so light bulb goes on. We fractured a couple of teeth. Pascal, I think, published something on this. So you're miss let's imagine you're missing four mill three millimeters of dentin, just a little thin layer of composite to even out the pulpal surface or whatever, then fill in the rest of the space, three, four millimeters of ceramic, and you'll, you'll get the best of both worlds. The thicker the ceramic is, the less likely it is to fracture. You only need about a half a millimeter of composite to dampen the stress to the tooth. There's no difference in stress to the tooth if the composite's a half millimeter, one, three, four, or five. You only need about a half millimeter. And so then it makes it easier. Yeah. Absolutely. And I've been doing it that way since uh, Mahal Patel, uh, who you may have known in the UK, very good prosthodontist. He actually told me he learned that from, from you and, and was influenced by you. And then he passed that on to me. Uh, and so, yes, I don't build the, the sort of foundation or core of composite. I, I uh, just add the thickness to my uh, lithium disilicate restoration. And, and it, that's a good thing to do, I think. Yeah, you do want to add about maybe about a half a minute. If, if your goal is to dampen the stress to the tooth, if the thought process, well, mm. I don't want to wedge the tooth or I want to even out the stress on the tooth, then either a structural flowable, meaning a strong flowable, okay, uh, that has high high flexural strength. I, I uh, use genial and, flow, like genial injectable, highly filled. But even yeah. then, I do my uh, IDS, I do my immediate dentine sealing with it, and that, for me, kills two birds with one stone. Is that a reasonable... Oh, that's a, that's a great, that's exactly how I think now too. Since we have now very good flowables that have high compressive strength that aren't like rubber, okay, that's exactly a great technique. That saves you time too. Amazing, brilliant. I'm loving the, the, the pace of this. We're, we're covering a lot of ground here. I've got two more questions here, general themes with this valuable time that I have with you. Okay, so now let's think about the topic of posterior ceramic onlays, lithium disilica onlays. I want to know your opinion, your clinical opinion, or any expertise or studies that you've seen comparing an Ivoclar product, uh, Emax, versus I believe is Lissy is GC, is that right? GC Lisi. Yeah, GC Lisi. So, mm. I have not seen it, okay, that somebody's compared it directly. And I've done a few GC Lisi, but not enough to say that, hey, like the 3000 Emacs. I can tell you, I have friends that I trust that would tell me the truth, okay, that have been working with the product since it was launched. And they're having very similar success rates as long as it's not layered. If it's just a monolithic, well bonded GC Lisi, they're not seeing any particular issues with failures coming back and things like that. When they start to run to failures, here's where people start to see failures, where they're doing conventional cementation, it's a little thinner, and, and, you know, because then the ceramic absorbs all the stress and or incorrect preparations for this type of material, which would be very soft and round on the inside, just pretty much following the anatomy of the tooth the best you can with no sharp internal line angles. You don't need any retention resistance for them if you have a periphery of enamel. And uh, both seem to be equally successful to me. Is there any uh, aesthetic, um, anecdotal aesthetic advantage of either? I would, okay, I think where people run into problem with Emacs, and you hear some people say they love it, they say it's gray. Emacs is an interesting material, and GC seemed to has solved the problem, and I don't know, they won't tell me what they did. Uh, e Emacs, you can't fire more than about two or three times. When you fire it a third and fourth time, it, it seems goes to, gray. It goes gray. And I think what's happening is the pigment's burning out. The pigment, whatever pigment was in there, so it's like table glass. You know, if you're your table in your living room and you look at it, it has a little greenish gray look. So it's just burning out the pigments. So I think uh, if you can keep it to one or two firing, essentially a glaze, right? If it's monolithic, a little paint glaze, I think you're fine. Hey guys, I know Dr. Adam McLaren has covered a lot here, but if you want a simple one-page summary of this podcast episode, so you got like a different which ceramic when kind of thing, when would you do what, then we've made a one-page infographic. You can download it on protrusive.co.uk forward slash ceramics. That's protrusive.co.uk forward slash ceramics. Back to the main episode.
Okay, fascinating. Uh, and so the last uh, question is to just discuss Zirconia. Now, I know you could probably sp speak for like five days in a row, full days, a couple of movies of yours in between uh, uh, to keep everyone occupied on this topic. But I yeah. love how you were able to b grasp this this big mammoth topic and how well read you are into just a couple of guidelines that general dentists can, can apply. And I love how you did that with the first question. So I don't want to really put this complex question for you because it's, it's oversimplifying it. But if we had to suggest just a guideline for the selection of the different types of zirconia. Now, you mentioned earlier 3Y, 5Y. If you don't mind a bit of revision, firstly, on what is a difference and then when okay. when to use which zirconia is essentially the question and when should you lay in, when should you use a monolithic form? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so, that's okay. So so 3Y means 3% of the molecules are yttria oxide, okay? And then 97% are zirconia. And the original materials like lava, most of you remember that name, were, were very opaque materials. Tetragonal zone, when you have 3% yttria, you have mostly 100% tetragonal shape crystal zirconia. It's very opaque, but very strong, okay? Ceramic engineers have known for years, uh, and they started to apply it to dentistry five, six, seven years ago, that if you increase the yttria contact, yttria oxide, added more yttria, a little bit less zirconia, it, uh, the, the final material had a phase shift. The crystal shifted to a cubic form of crystal, okay? Because there's actually about four or five, but three main ones, three shapes of zirconia, which actually kind of behave like three different materials, to tell you the truth. So this material has been, people have been calling it 5-mole or 5-y. So what they mean is 5% of the molecules, when you hear 5-y, are... Yttria, which creates a material that's about 50% cubic zirconia and 50% tetragonal zirconia. A fake diamond is 100% cubic zirconia. You have to put about 8% of the molecules in there at yttria. Now, there's one thing that comes up because people have asked me, they said, well, I open up this little thing that I get from the manufacturer, and I don't see 3 or 4 or 5. Why? I don't understand. I see 8%. 7%, that's by weight, okay? So they have to, according to the FDA, they have to report the different amounts by weight. So volume is different, okay? Volume is different. That's the same thing with our composites, right? We got a 70% weight filler, but by volume it's 30%. It's just, just a different, each molecule has a little different weight, and that's, that's what that means. All right, so the newer, newer seven years we've been on the market roughly, um, uh, cubic containing 5Y materials are much more translucent. We've all seen that. And they're very temperamental because you'll get from one lab a little opaque-ish and one lab it'll be beautiful. So it's part material and part firing. These materials are very, very sensitive to firing, actually more than porcelain. So if you fire them wrong, they can look like a marble or they could turn gray to uh, like Emacs example. All right, so where would I use those today? Those materials are strong enough for single crowns anywhere in the mouth. They're about 750 megapascals when, you, when you're done sintering them. Now, here's an interesting thing about a 5Y material. We were the first one publishing on this. When you sandblast the inside of a 5Y material, okay, the cubic crystal, it, it does not strengthen like a 3Y. Like you probably heard that you can sandblast a 3Y material. It does not weaken at all. Um, because it's a little micro crack phenomenon, there's a phase transformation and blah, 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 okay? So, the functional strength of a 5Y material is not 750 megapascals. When you're done processing the inside, it's about 5 or 550. Perfect, that's plenty for a crown. 550 megapascals is plenty for a crown, but not for a bridge, okay? So the 3Y materials were originally for layering. There's a material that's in between called a 4Y material. It means 4% of the molecules are yttria, 96% of the molecules are tetragonal. That 4Y material forms a material that's roughly 30% cubic and 70% tetragonal. Two good things about that. It's almost as translucent as the 5Y. Not quite, but almost. Here's the nice thing about that material. The flexural strength is still up very high, around 1,000 megapascals but you can still sandblast it. So when you sandblast it, it's still a thousand. When you sandblast a 5Y material, it goes from 750 to 500 because you weaken it, just like glass, okay? So where do you use that? 
So anywhere in the mouth that I wanted a monolithic restoration, single tooth, I'm going to use a five line material. Okay, uh, STML from Noritake, most people know, uh, or the super, the high translucent, but you need to ask those questions if they're five line materials. The lab will know, or they should know that anyway. Okay, so I'm using single restorations anywhere in the mouth. Maybe for a small three unit monolithic bridge in the anterior part of the mouth, 500 megapascals, probably okay. Okay, the ADA says we need six, maybe 800 for megapascals for a long span bridge. So for any bridge work, I use a 4Y material. That's the material that's 30% cubic phase. Here's the nice thing about that. It's translucent enough that it looks decent monolithic. I wouldn't say great, but decent. And, and the reality is, is most of our patients are fine with decent aesthetics, right? Especially if they've got such bad teeth they've walked around with that we're doing an all on four, an all on six, or none on one, or something like that. Okay, <laughs> so for the... For any bridge work, I would use a 4Y material. Here's also the nice thing about it, is it's strong enough to layer if you want to. You can cut it back and layer like a 3Y material. I don't know that I would layer a 5Y material, maybe a little bit on the facial, but I would not cut it back to a thin coping and layer. Then you're, gonna, you're probably gonna see some fractures down the road. So, so simple, 5Y monolithic, okay? 4Y monolithic for bridges and micro layering. Got it. So you said uh, five Y for any monolithic crown anywhere in the mouth, including anterior. Yeah. Probably don't layer it unless you have to a little bit in the facial. Four Y um, for bridges, maybe for a crown, it's overkill because you've got the five Y anyway. Uh, and then you can layer that with a bit more uh, predictability and, and less risk. Yeah. And so let's maybe maybe look at it from a different perspective. A lot of times, you know, a lot of smaller labs or dentists, you don't want to have five million materials in the drawer because you got to pay for all that stuff. Can you distill it down even more? So here, here's what I would do. You could do you easily use 4Y material for your crowns, okay? For posterior crowns, monolithic. Or something like Prime, which is 3Y, 4Y, and 5Y from our avocar. They've made a gradient of yttria and thus a gradient of cubic face in it, which is a nice material. Use that for your single crowns. Use it for your bridges. And then do Emacs or GC Lisi or Suprinity or Ambria, any of the high strength glass ceramics you like on anterior teeth. And then for the right case, a feldspathic veneer for the right case. That's such a brilliant real world application, uh, keeping in mind that we don't want to be stocking all these different types of ceramics and materials. So uh, I like that real world recommendation. I think we'll all gain uh, a lot from that. Um, I, those are the main questions uh, I want to cover and you covered them so wonderfully. So thank you so much. Are there any other things that based on the questions that you're thinking, you know what, it'd be really good to on this topic to, to give these nuggets to these dentists all over the world. A lot of the UK dentists listen to this one uh, and also US and Australia. Anything while you have the microphone before I want to then know, uh, know about how we can learn further from you. I, well, I think I've covered it all. I mean, you, you've got the, you know, the simplistic idea of how I do a case. I mean, basically feldspathic veneer, anterior, usually Emacs in the posterior. Okay, that's usually what I do if you came walking in and you were a patient of mine, uh, unless I can't bond. If for whatever reason, maybe subgingival margins or maybe I can't isolate, they've got a tongue the size of a horse or something like that, then I'm going to use zirconia, and then for bridges, I'll use zirconia, okay? So that would be the, the basic thought process there. So no more PFM for you? No, I haven't done a PFM in ages. I, I don't have a problem with it if you want to do a PFM. Uh, but, you know, conservative prep with a zirconia crown, take advantage of the, of the substrate, a color to bleed through. You know, the only time I might maybe I might consider a PFM is where I maybe had a completely black tooth and I wanted to just make a thimble, as thin as possible, metal framework that I could gold coat so I could get a little warmness to it uh, so that I had as much room for porcelain because I had to completely opaque the tooth. That might be the one reason for it, okay? How about gold, Ed? Are you using much gold? Uh, personally, as a, I used to love doing gold work. I did a lot of gold, and I made it myself. I'm my own, I do all my ceramics today, and I still I have for a number of years. I, I don't have a problem with it, but I got to tell you, the pay, once you start getting known for doing, you know, nice looking aesthetics, I, I, I got I find people won't even you know like, like this. If I used to make a gold a clizzle, what's that? I can't remember that. <laughs> You know, they, they, they hated the label metal. They hated it. So, no, I think it's a fabulous restoration. Absolutely. If if patient doesn't care about aesthetics uh, and uh, you like doing it, 
Uh, absolutely, especially some of your older patients that are bruxers. Oh, here, I was going to go to an interesting place. Thankfully, thankfully mentioned that, so it popped back in my head. So then one of the questions related to this, so what do you do on a significant wear case, like you said, for your, for your bruxers, and you've got to restore them. Right? Now, historically, let's start historically for, for, uh, for what people would do. Is they, somebody coming with a lot of wear, maybe a little short teeth, and they want to have new looking teeth. Typically, what did we do? We cut all the rest of the tooth structure down, and we make crowns, and maybe we open the bite, depending on your belief system. I've been doing this long enough to know that I completely disagree with the Dawson philosophy that vertical dimension is stable through life and teeth are super up at the same point. Uh, I completely disagree. They treated enough patients over the years that their wear exceeded their super eruption that I was able to restore their vertical and they did fine and obviously some didn't. But think about that for a second, the, the concept, okay? Patient's 50 years old. Over 50 years, they've worn off 50% of their tooth structure. So you're gonna treat a wear case. They walk in the door and your mindset is, that old mindset, you're gonna take off the 30 or 40% more of their tooth structure. You're gonna destroy 30% more in the next couple of hours, and that's a treatment? Yep, that's yep, treatment. but well said. Okay, so, you know, that early on, in fact, right when Emacs came out, that popped into my head. This is the material to use for wear cases. So if I can restore vertical, great. So I restore them, as, I open as much as I can, I feel functionally, of course, you're gonna test it out with your temporaries, your aesthetic prototypes, your mock-ups, whatever you wanna call it, see if they reestablish some closest speaking base, uh, vertical dimension of rest, see if their muscles are fine, see if you test that first, then you go to the final, and then basically I just go for one millimeter thick Emacs. So I prep through my mock-up, when I get a millimeter, great, if I already, if I have a more, more than a millimeter of, of composite or acrylic in there, wonderful, it's even thicker then, okay? So that's how I would restore uh, a wear case. And of course, I'm not going to do porcelain veneers in a wear case. I'm, I'm going to do bonded Emacs on those those types of cases. But I never like how that looks, to tell you the truth. I just, ah, just looks different to me. Amazing. Thanks for covering that guideline for, for, for wear cases. Uh, I'm sure we gained so much from today's episode. Uh, Ed, your place is called, is it Art Oral America? Yeah, so you can find my courses on AO, it's Art Oral America, and I kind of partnered with DTG, Dental Technicians Guild, AOADTG.com. And then I have my own website called edmclaren.com. And then I got, I'll keep all my articles and crap on there. Actually, it was interesting you bring that up. Some marketing people said, you've created so much confusion in the marketplace because you've got names everywhere. Names for Think Blue. You've got names for Black, Back in Black now. You've got Art Oral America. you got this. So they said, you need to settle on one name. <laughs> so I'm actually just hired an IT guy in, in about a month or two. It's everything's just going to be under Ed McLaren. So you can find everything under AOADTG.com. But next month, it'll be just my name so you can find it. And the, the courses that you run, are they catered for uh, dentists or technicians or, or, or both? Or what, what, who are you mostly teaching nowadays? D, all of the above. <laughs> so I'm a technician and a dentist and a prosthodontist. So I have courses for dentists. I have courses for technicians and I have courses for teams. And I just restarted a course. You've probably seen this course called full digital uh, workflow from Milos. Uh, mm -hmm. Lee Culp and I did that in 2008, 2009. And then Sam Puri and I did it 2013, 2014. And it stopped for various reasons. Uh, and we just started it again a month ago with Jed Archibald. So we take a patient start to finish we do everything digital, but I like to call it the digital dental team because I don't believe purely digital restorations look that good. I believe that we have to add a little human touch. We change a line angle, we paint a little bit, we put a little surface texture, we, we do a little something to, to bring that good to great, good to great. And so that's basically the course that's called the digital dental team where we treat a live patient. And I actually let the participants machine some veneers. The dentists get to try theirs in and play with texture and stuff like that. So that's a fun course. And that's all in LA? Yeah, well, it's all in my facility here in Park City, Utah, okay? And because if I'm gonna treat a live patient, uh, I gotta have a good facility. I gotta feel comfortable because we gotta start and finish in three days. But yeah, I mean, I do courses all over. You can just check my website or my social media and, and usually I post where I'm gonna be, if I'm gonna be in Egypt or I'm gonna be in England or something like that, so.
Well, I, I, I'd love to catch you in US one day and I'll put the links on the, the website so everyone can check out. And if, guys, if anything, right, I'm going to try and summarize this in the in the notes in a PDF format, all the sort of guidelines, recommendations. But do check out Ed McLaren's website if there's, if there's content and do check out the movies. I'm telling you, the movies, you, you, you know, keep hearing me saying it, they are something else. Ed, thanks so much for everything you do for the profession and really appreciate one of my heroes giving, uh, giving me some time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, the, and the videos, five of the videos are on and YouTube on Ed McLaren. Okay, so. Perfect. There we have it, guys. The epic, the one and only Ed McLaren. Wasn't he just awesome? He's just a top guy. I'd love to go to the States and learn more from him, spend some more time with him. It makes you feel really great when these amazing clinicians give up their time to come on this show. So thanks for listening all the way to the end. I know you gained so much from that, as did I. Once again, if you want to download the infographic, it's protrusive.co.uk forward slash ceramics. That'll take you straight to the page where you can download the infographic PDF. And it was just like a helpful aid memoir to summarize the findings from this episode. So anyway, thanks so much for joining me. Uh, if you found this useful or if you know of a dentist, your colleague who's also struggling with ceramic decision making, please send them a link to this podcast. Share the love. Thanks so much. And I'll catch you in the next episode. <laughs>